Oh, hey, everyone. I think we're live. I wasn't sure if we started. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for joining us uh, here today, joining CASC at our annual general meeting. Um, I just wanted to uh, let you all know that uh, voting is now open until 9 p.m. for the budget. So go to the Facebook um, live stream and you'll be able to do that. Um, I'm really excited that we get to meet here today in these uh, extraordinary circumstances. Um, I, I'd like to thank first off our executive board who you all get to see, uh, Monty Scott, Charlie Demers, and the newest members of our executive team, Daryl Purvis. Uh, yeah, there they are. <laughs> I was like, I'm by myself here. Uh, and our, the newest members, Daryl Purvis, Paul Snaps, and Drew Picklick. I'd also like to thank Adam Groh, who has now moved from the executive to work exclusively on CanCom, which is the foundation for Canadian comedy. Uh, so this is our wonderful exec. I just want to give a round of applause. <laughs> um, I'd also like to thank our partners, Joanne Britton of the Mobs Press, Damian N uh, Nelson of Wanton Able, and Andrew Shaw of 21 Ton. Your selfless dedication to the cause is very is incredible to us and has been so helpful um, in your guidance has been remarkable. Um, also, a shout out to of gratitude to our lobbyists Tara Mazurk and Sean Casey from Global Public Affairs, who will be joining us uh, right after I speak today. Um, they have been working nonstop stop since this crisis started, uh, and we've been working in partnership to ensure that our voices are heard at uh, all government levels, and we will be hearing from them shortly. Um, I'd like to start off today by just setting up some of the context for the work that CASC has been doing, as well as a highlight reel of where the industry is at. It certainly has been an incredible journey over the last three years. I'm really proud of the work that we've done, the awareness that we've built, uh, the allies we've made in this extraordinary movement to um, lobby for comedians' rights and to ele elevate Canadian comedy, both in Canada and around the world. Uh, we now offer a health and benefits plan through AFBS, the Actor Fraternal Benefits Society, which was a goal of ours from the beginning and a real need uh, that uh, was in our community. And I'd like to uh, thank Scott Falconbridge for helping to make that happen. It's with, it's with volunteers like Scott who helps to, um, you know, really propel uh, our actions forward and create, uh, you know, a stronger community. Um, we will continue to, off, to work to offer more of the benefits. Uh, Haven Helpline, which is a 24 uh, our seven day a week uh, hotline for to report sexual harassment and violence uh, was something that we were preparing to launch, but it was halted by the pandemic. And so we hope that we can we'll be able to do that within uh, the next several months. Our uh, co our uh, campaign hashtag pay comedians rolled out over the last year, and we believe that it's really had a significant impact and a positive effect on uh, paying comedians. There's a lot more work to do there. We've uh, developed a pay comedians guideline that will roll out once we're back up on our stages. Um, so it's a guideline for producers and for comedians to uh, consult, um, you know, in, in a mul multiple uh, situations. Um, so when we look back to the last year, uh, to last year, we emerged from a crisis over Channel 168 stronger and more united than ever. And it was clear that we had more work to do to defend our rights as storytellers in this country and work with our gatekeepers to build a solid foundation for comedians to grow, uh, work and thrive. Our mission seems solidified. It would be a long road, but a necessary one. And who would have known that a year later we would be facing a crisis so monumental that we would have to face it in lockdown, isolated from our family, our friends and each other. Um, that we wouldn't be able to gather to laugh and perform and get it out all off stage. Now we just got uh, Twitter. Um, this pandemic has shaken us in spirit, in mind, in creativity, but it's, it's rallied us in so many extraordinary ways, mostly that we need to be in community, and it, uh, which is the only way that we can survive. I'm excited for what this will bring, uh, but the road to get there uh, is definitely going to be painful at times. 20 Martin marked a, a turning point for Canadian comedy. At the end of the year, it was clear that 2020 had to be the year of action and demonstration, and that, and that each and every one of us uh, must rise up and demand our rights as artists in, the, in this country. We are seeing now how our lack of status uh, and recognition is challenging the very survival of our craft and our venues. There is no more critical time than now that we challenge the government and their definitions and assessment of who gets support and who doesn't. 
Several weeks ago, the government began announcing sector-specific stimulus as a result of the pandemic. They announced $500 million to arts and culture that would include the sports sector and be distributed through Canadian Heritage and their various agencies like the Canada Council for the Arts. We were told this would be good news for our sector, and it is generally speaking, but once CASC started asking questions about who exactly was going to benefit, it became less clear of where we fit in. CASC is currently in one of the most profound phases of our lobbying efforts. We've had several conversations with the Department of Canadian Heritage over the last several weeks, as, as well as with Julie Jabrusin, who is my MP, Toronto Danforth. She's been one of our strongest allies since day one. And she's also now the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Canadian Heritage. Initially, our conversations were to ensure comedians would be able to uh, take part in short-term benefits like the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit that provides $2,000 to individuals for a four-week period. We expressed to them the huge impact this pandemic immediately had on our industry. Um, and they worked to widen the inclusivity for that program thanks to ACTRA and to other arts organizations. While SERP is our lifeline, sector stimulus is our life preserver. We realized, we realized, CASP realized we needed to do something more. So we made a, a request through CANCOM, which is the foundation for Canadian comedy, as I mentioned before. Adam will be speaking more on that. That was incorporated last year. And we asked uh, the Department of Heritage for one and a half million of those stimulus dollars to distribute immediately to comedians to fund creation while in quarantine. Because we believe that, you know, once this is over, uh, that comedians would be poised, um, you know, to launch these creations. The vision for CanCom, for those of you who don't know, is that it would act like a factor grant for music. If you're familiar with factor, you know how important this grant is to the music industry and how it was and how it has fueled a, a star system in our country. After we submitted our application to Heritage, they followed up with a phone call and told us that they didn't want us to raise our expectations because that stimulus money was, would go to existing channels. And that's exactly what happened. In their announcements last Friday, they didn't mention comedy. They continue to leave comedy out of their conversations because it's not largely reflected in the existing funding recipients. We are asking they start to include it. How can we have a conversation about arts in the country when we don't include comedy? It's vital as we move forward and vital that cast members take action to start accessing what's available, not only for comedians, but for our country and our culture. These discussions will be crucial in the next couple of weeks as there may be some assistance in phase two of the stimulus money that will go to some organizations that are currently non-existing funding recipients. Tara and Sean will elaborate further. One of the major questions is how will comedy venues survive when some landlords are not helping tenants and not participating in the Ontario Canada Emergency Commercial Rent Assistance Program? How are landlords still able to charge and expect pre-COVID rent? That's why we formed a comedy venue task force that includes myself, Gary Rideout from Comedy Bar, as well as Second City and Tyler Schultz from Rumors Comedy Club in Winnipeg. We urge other venues to join the task force um, because these conversations that we're having in the next couple of weeks are vital. And if you'd like to join, please email me at sandra at canadianstandup.ca. Even though we continue to endure this global crisis with some light now emerging at the end of the tunnel, what, what preceded is the crisis in our culture, which was the impetus behind the rally we had planned for this past April. One, and one, unfortunately, we couldn't uh, get together to do. With ever-shrinking opportunities for Canadian creators in a media landscape so heavily influenced and monopolized by the United States, now more than ever, we need to rally behind one another. Canadian comedians have come to form a second class in our own country. You see it on TV, hear it on the radio waves, and experience it at our biggest festivals. It's something I call the circle of entrapment. In the month and a half before Christmas, it was as though every other week the broadcasters were conspiring to further erode our Canadian content. In November, Chorus Entertainment applied to the CRTC to defer their spend on Canadian content, or to be more technically accurate, their Canadian production expenditure. The reason being, they said, was they made too much money in 2019 compared to 20, 2018. And therefore, this uptick in revenue meant they had to spend $23, $23 million more than originally anticipated in their fiscal 2019 budget. And this, according to Chorus, would put them in a vulnerable financial position in future years. So they asked the CRTC if they could, ver they could defer it to 2020 when their license expires. How convenient. 
The Canadian Media's Produ Media Producers Association expressed concern that if the CRTC grants chorus re courses request, there is a real risk that these deferred expenditures may never be made. They also argued the situation arose because chorus underspent on their Canadian production expenditure requirements the previous year, leaving one and a half million dollars unspent in their development envelopes, which means it refrained from triggering funding that could have supported dozens of projects. Chorus countered that they simply didn't receive enough quality pitches to justify the spend. This is absurd. I'm sure the collective pitch power in this room tonight could literally blow Chorus's roof off. Then Bell and Rogers submitted a joint intervention letter asking the CRTC for the same flexibility. If Chorus, Chorus gets to defer, defer their spend, then we want to too. Then, in a shocking move by the CBC in early December, they applied to lower their Canadian content requirements. The Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. There is surely something sinister going on here. When you look at the lineups for CTV and Rogers, it's all American content. What did Bell make last year? Two new shows? Rogers made nothing. Literally. Is that even legal? One comedian before a pitch meeting at Rogers was told, we don't make comedies. Okay, so what the hell am I doing here? And, and this is really the story of Canadian entertainment. Spend less, don't invest, keep our voices silent. This may seem trivial to some, but what happens to our culture? Where do our stories live? Where do we live? Increasingly not in this country. Every time a creator moves away to the United States or abroad, our voices diminish. Our stories disappear. When we do create content in Canada, it's sporadic. It lacks vision. It's fueled a fragmented Canadian identity that copies more than it innovates and values American culture and history over our own. But what this crisis revealed for some comedians who were living in the U.S. was, who, what, sorry, what this crisis revealed for some comedians was that living in the U.S. was no longer an option. With very little support and a volatile politics, the uncertainty was too stressful. They returned home. We're so happy they're back, but what do we do now? We need to fundamentally change how we support and propel our artists and our stories. What if instead of creating content in Canada because we have to, to fulfill Canadian content requirements, we create content because we want to, because it's our right to tell our stories. Comedy has this way of reflecting our Canadian life so immediately, in real time, like few other art forms. Let's grow this together. We have a great executive who you just saw who are passionate, but we need more help. We have a lot of work to do. And we recognize some comedians have been afraid to associate with us for fear of reprisal, but you have the freedom of association. It's in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. For those who told you to stay quiet so you could continue to work, they did you a disservice. While we stayed quiet, our industry was slowly disappearing. And now we're seeing the true cost of that in action. With labor movements exploding around the planet and the collective will to fairly compensate our frontline workers so that they are protected and continue to serve with dignity, it's time for us all to rise up and work together to create a more just world and a more equitable industry. The urgency for comedians is now. It seems ludicrous that we have something in our country called Canadian content requirements, but without it, we literally would be subsumed into the media cyclops of Hollywood and Silicon Valley. Canadian content requirements began in the 70s with Pierre Trudeau, who implemented programs mandating Canadian content in film and broadcasting and, get, and gave substantial subsidies to develop the Canadian media and cultural industries. The, so this is a message to Justin Trudeau. Now more than ever, we urge you to continue your father's legacy. Demand and enforce that our broadcasters create Canadian content so that our artists can live here and thrive. Comedy is one of Canada's greatest legacies. Let's tell the world about it. This is a matter of national urgency. The threats though are from all sides. And it's not just the broadcasters who prioritize American content over our own. When Ontario's Minister for Economic Development, Vic Fideli commented on the recent explosion of studio space in the GTA by streaming services such as Netflix and Amazon and Apple, squeezing out Canadian creators who can't afford to make shows in Toronto, he said, Quote, it doesn't bother me if this country's creators have to go outside of the major centres to make Canadian stories. He sees Toronto as a place where Canadians get trained on foreign productions and then work on smaller domestic stories in places such as Perry Sound or his hometown of North Bay. For Toronto, you really need this big horsepower of CBS. We're not horse, we're mule. 
When Armando Nunes, the president and chief executive of CBS Global Distribution Group, downplayed concerns that Canadians might have about the explosion of American content swamping Canadian creators and their stories, he said, quote, hasn't that ship sailed? I mean, through technology, you can be swamped by any content from any place around the world. We've always been sensitive to the idiosyncrasies of Canada as a market and Canadian cultural sensitivities. That is something over the years we've had conversations with our broadcast partners about. But at the end of the day, the fact is that Canada has warmly and enthusiastically embraced American content, irrespective of where it gets made, as if we had the choice. The prejudice and arrogance in this statement from Nunes has come to define our industry. When the Canada Council for the Arts responded to our requests to evaluate comedy outside of being a theater or literary submission, we were recently, to, we were recently told, if we approve comedy, where do we draw the line? Whose line is it anyway? I'd argue it's ours. The leadership at Canada Council for the Arts has expressed mechanisms and channels to apply, but we need more comedians applying. We will be hosting a forum with global public affairs in the future to help comedians do just that. This is an important step for us to gain recognition. And lastly, I'll say this about our art, about our labor. I was reading an article about poverty in the United States a while back. And in it, the author discussed the relationship between capital and labor. So capital says, I will put the minimum value on you labor, i.e. Min the minimum wage, so you don't starve to death. And labor says, wait a minute, we're the only value. Without us, without us there is no capital. This rings true more now than ever. Capital goes further and postures the illusion that every time they give you a job or offer you a gig, they pretend as though it's an act of benevolence. Without our art, our labor, there is no show, there is no festival, there is no recording, there is no content. So in absence of any official aid, we launched the Emergency Relief Fund for Canadian Comedians on GoFundMe, and I'm pleased to announce that we're almost at $30,000. I mean, this is a true sign of what it means to work together as a community. The goal for, for this fund would be that it lives on because this crisis revealed another large gap in our industry that there is no emergency relief for comedians in need. And that, and that is, you know, catastrophic. It can be catastrophic at times. I'd like to thank our volunteers, Derek Forgan, Andrew Shaw, and Damian Nelson and Joanne who helped launch this fund. And thank you to Just for Laughs who have collaborated on this with us and helped to spread the word with their partners. We are urgently, urgently awaiting money from them so that we can, um, you know, start to uh, do the lottery. We were supposed to receive it today, but nothing yet. They've been very overloaded and there's been a real delay and lag. And so the second we get the money, we will conduct our first lottery. Um, thank you so much for your patience to the community. Uh, my heartfelt gratitude uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, love for the art that we do and the community that uh, that keeps us going. And I'll now hand it over to Tara and Sean. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandra. I'm just waiting for my colleague to join us. Uh, good evening, everyone, or good afternoon if you're on the West Coast. Uh, my name is Sean Casey. Uh, I am Vice President of Cultural Affairs at Global Public Affairs, and uh, my colleague Tara Mazurka, let her introduce herself. Hi there, I'm Tara Mazurka, of course, working with Sean, Senior Consultant for Cultural Industries at the federal level, and we are both based here in Ottawa and work exclusively for the cultural industries, um, right across performing arts, visual arts, um, film, television, so we're pleased to be here today. Yeah, we've had the pleasure of working with uh, Sandra and many on the CASC team now for uh, a little bit over a year. We might actually be pushing uh, into year number two now. Uh, of course, the uh, the crisis that has enveloped uh, this country is unlike anything ever, anyone has ever seen before, uh, bringing out some, some unique uh, opportunities for the government to provide some level of emergency support and funding for all those in the sector that require it to shore up the foundations of many of the important institutions that are going to help rebuild uh, this country uh, once we are on the other side of the uh, COVID-19 mountain. Uh, what we wanted to do this evening is take this opportunity. Uh, I'm here in Ottawa, Tara is across the river in Quebec. Uh, just have the opportunity to go through some of the funding programs that are currently available that the government has put forward. Uh, again, um, covering all the bases from individual funding programs to those more uh, focused on individual companies, bars, 
comedy clubs, making sure that we cover all the bases in terms of what's available right at the moment and what we see coming down the pipe uh, over the next uh, few weeks. So Tara, I'll turn it over to you to put the slideshow up and we'll uh, allow people to follow along uh, about what we're discussing. Sean, do you see oh, it there? I do. Okay, so yeah, you make it big, make me small, and that's that's great. Um, okay, first and foremost, this is probably the most popular uh, program in terms of overall subscription from uh, the Canadian public and Canadian companies. It's the Canadian Emergency Wage Subsidy, more commonly known as the seventy-five percent subsidy, uh, up to eight hundred and forty-seven dollars per week for all employers, uh, no matter what size, no matter what sector. The only thing they need to show is a drop in gross revenues of at least 15% for March uh, or 30% for April and May. You may note that it's already May the 11th. Uh, this is a retroactive program, so it can go back to cover wages from up to two months ago. Uh, it will run for a 12-week period from the 15th of March to the 6th of June. Uh, prior to this program coming into place, there was a 10% uh, temporary wage subsidy, which was uh, a payroll allotment. Uh, basically, you did not remit taxes on your payroll if you're an employer. Uh, that is still in place and many not-for-profits took advantage of that payroll subsidy. Uh, but what they will do in that case is you don't unfortunately get an 85% cover off of your wages. You will end up getting a 75%. They'll take the 10% off and just give you a 65% to cover off. Some of the other important components to this, uh, again, one of the things they found uh, when they were reviewing the wage subsidy was that, especially for those in the arts and culture sector, it was very hard to show a revenue loss of um, month 2020 versus month 2019. So March, April, or May of 2020 versus those uh, similar months from a year prior. Unfortunately, this program was really set up uh, under a small and medium-sized business lens. I like to use the example of if you are a company that is making 15,000 widgets uh, in 2019 in March of last year, and you make 75,000 widgets this year, you can show that drop in overall uh, um, amount by 50%, so it's very easy to show. Uh, intangible products that uh, many of the arts and culture sector are involved in, much harder to show. So they did try to change the metrics somewhat that if it was hard to show in that month versus year comparison, that you could go back to the beginning of this year and do an average of January and February 2020 and apply that to either March, April, or May to try to show that 15 or 30% reduction in overall revenues. Of course, whichever metric you use, you do have to use it for all three periods uh, during this fund. Uh, the other, uh, as, as I mentioned, one of the other uh, points the government did put into place was originally it was a 30% reduction across the board. They realized that the pandemic did not hit a lot of organizations all that hard until midway through March. So they reduced the amount that you have to show in terms of revenue loss to only 15% for March. And how that comes into play on the next slide, one of the other things they did, which was a very positive announcement when they passed the legislation about three weeks ago, was that if you are found eligible for a revenue loss in a specific period, that will actually carry through to the next period. For example, for March, if you show that 15% loss, that will cover you off for your application, not only for March, but for the April period as well. You don't have to go and show again that you've lost 30%. That 15% carries for two cycles. Subsequently, if you decide you're not going to apply for the March period, you apply for April, that 30% reduction still holds, but again, it holds for two cycles, the April and May cycle. So again, this was an opportunity for people that didn't have to do extra paperwork, having the double cycle, it gets more people into the system much quicker. 
Now, on the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, um, this will be for most of you who are applying as individuals. Um, so those who are have stopped working because of COVID-19 are eligible for regular EI benefits. Even those who were expecting seasonal work and now are not because of COVID-19 or those who were on employment insurance before and um, their their employment benefit period has run out. So there are some notes on the slide um, to be eligible for $2,000 for every four weeks up to 16 weeks. Um, and the eligibility periods are on the government's website. But you must live in Canada and are at least 15 years old. Um, you must have not voluntarily quit your job. But if you are attached to a company, you can still be receiving the CERB and still attached to a company. You just can't um, uh, dip into the Canada emergency wage subsidy and this at the same time or double dip or have more of that income. You would have had to have uh, income of at least $5,000 in 2019 or in the 12 months prior to the date of your application. Um, and good news for gig workers as well, you are able to earn up to $1,000 per month while collecting the CERB and royalties for work created prior to the CERB eligibility periods are not included. Um, but you can include your royalty payments in that $5,000 to be eligible. So more information is available, of course, on the government's website. If you are a business owner and you pay yourself with dividends, there's also information on the website about what dividends are eligible or not to count as income. Um, and if you are receiving income for your business and some of that money is going towards business expenses, you don't need to count that. It, the $1,000 per month really is for any income that you are receiving personally as that threshold. One of the other uh, emergency uh, responses that the government has put in place is the Canada Emergency Business Account. Again, this is a an interest-free loan of $40,000 available for both small business and not-for-profits to help cover the operating costs. They have on the lower end reduced and on the upper end exceeded the parameters uh, in terms of the uh, payroll that you would have to demonstrate that you have, it's down to $20,000 and up to $1.5 million in 2019. Uh, the one positive about this emergency business account loan is if it is paid back by December 31st, 2022, 25% of the amount will be forgiven. So in essence, it becomes a $10,000 grant that would go towards your organization. This is one of the few programs that is not run directly through the government. It is through your bank or credit union in conjunction with the government. Uh, all of those uh, loans are processed through that portal. And for the Canada Emergency Commercial Rent Assistance, yet another Canada emergency measure. Um, this program will lower rent by 75% for small businesses, including nonprofits and charities that have been affected by COVID-19. Um, this means that the government will put in about 50%, the landlord will have to put in at least 25%, and the tenant could put into a max of 25%. Now, this federal program or a federal initiative is, of course, uh, worked on in collaboration with the provinces and territories as it is under their jurisdiction. Um, so if you're looking, uh, if your landlord is going to be accessing these programs, there are rules and parameters province by province. Um, of course, it is a forgivable loan to the commercial landlord. Um, so they are administering this and working with the tenants to deliver this assistance program. Um, at the federal level, it's managed by the Canada um, Mortgage and Housing Corporation. So um, the impacted small business tenants would be businesses that are paying less than $50,000 per month um, and those who have temporarily ceased operations or have experienced at least a 70% drop in pre-COVID revenues. Um, so I know that CASC has a task force on the commercial rent assistance. It may apply to many uh, venues and even some small businesses that may be on the call. Um, so I, of course, will leave it to CASC to go into how someone can get involved in the task force and if this program would affect you. Now, this is the program that everyone is talking about now. It's the $500 million uh, Canadian Heritage Fund. It's for arts, culture, and sport. 
Uh, again, it will be administered by Canadian Heritage. These are the parameters that they are looking to, as Sandra mentioned in her opening remarks, uh, spread the money out through existing channels to start, which is phase one of this program. Uh, again, much of that money will start to flow to recipients uh, of Canada Council or Canadian Heritage funding this week. Uh, the one part that uh, has not been covered off and will be launched in about a two week period is phase two. Now phase two is for those organizations and individuals who have not received money through uh, current Canada, Canadian Heritage or Canada Council for the Arts funding uh, avenues. Uh, I'm following along in the chat box here and I see both Norm and Sam have put questions regarding subcontractors. This is the whole idea of around this fund that they were looking as a complementary wage support uh, for those individuals or organizations that weren't able to access the wage subsidy due to uneven or lumpy revenues or the fact that the wage subsidy only covers off employees and not contractors. The idea of this fund is to provide a level of support for those who have contractors uh, as part of their employment setup um, for that phase two. They are projecting that they will have roughly a third of the money available in the arts and culture pot, which is about 200 million of the overall fund, all told about 65 million. They may have a little bit more. The details for the application and process on that are expected to come in the next two weeks, but that is the direct funding avenue to address questions related to uh, those who have contractors and do not have employees as part of their uh, employment status. Now, for Canada Council for the Arts, uh, I know that many of you may be curious about the application process. There are, um, there's one thing in particular, digital originals, that I wanted to bring your attention to. This is a partnership with CBC and Radio Canada and their micro grants of $5,000. So individual artists, groups, and organizations can apply and they can adapt their existing work or create new work for digital dissemination. Um, and the CBC Radio Canada commits to showing all funded pro projects on at least one of their platforms. So applications are accepted through the Canada Council beginning in mid-May, so that's coming out soon, um, and on a rolling basis until June 15th. So that information, again, is on the Canada Council for the Arts website. If you have not made an applicant profile, that will be the first step. So if you've never gone to the Canada Council for the Arts or you don't know how to apply, the first thing to do is build that applicant profile. Of course, it's going to take you a few days to put together that information, and then it's going to take about 15 business days for the Canada Council to verify that profile, and they may come back with questions. Um, but of course, the leadership of the Canada Council did, has said comedy is eligible to apply. Um, there may be some hoops to go through when going under the, the theatre or the writing discipline, um, but the Canada Council deals with this on a regular basis. Uh, different disciplines or applicants that don't quite fit into their framework, but nonetheless, um, um, have an assessment process and supportive process around that. If you are an organization, there's also the Digital Strategy Fund. Um, and up until July 31st, the Digital Strategy Fund will accept applications for digital solutions in response to the COVID-19 crisis. So you can apply anytime up until uh, the end of July and for requests up to $50,000. Sorry, $50, and lastly, many of you may be wondering where does the Broadcasting and Telecommunications Act review fall under this whole pandemic and all of this emergency response. Because the review of the Broadcasting and Telecommunications Acts were in the current government mandate letter, they still want to move forward with it, even though it may be a little bit delayed. So current governments and opposition parties are exploring solutions and, and policy frameworks. So the discussion is still going. Um, and it's going to be even more integral as we try to explore the marketplace solutions for economic recovery. Um, what does our in what did our industry look like before? What do we need to what did we want to advocate for? How could it look like um, after the pandemic? And how can the broadcasting and telecommunications review help support this? Further, we know that CASC has uh, participated in a number of CRTC proceedings on various broadcasting licenses and reviews. Um, there's a radio review as well. So these proceedings are continuing, but deadlines are adjusted, very similar to some of the mandate priorities. They're a little bit delayed, um, but nonetheless are continuing. 
Um, and I believe that is it for us. Now, I note that uh, we're going to be taking some questions at the end of the uh, AGM, uh, although there is one here in the box from, from Nikki Payne. I, and, oh, I like magic comes up here. Uh, will some of the Canadian Heritage Fund go to the artists who may choose to go back to school and upgrade skills post-COVID? Now, uh, on the phase one money, it is going through primarily organizations. I do believe there are probably some artists who have applied through Canada Council who would be getting that funding. Um, one of the mandate priorities of this fund is to getting it back into the hands of the artists. And by putting it putting it out through the current funding streams, whether they be Canadian Heritage or Canada Council, um, it is allowing for maximum flexibility once the money would get into an artist's hands, what he or she would like to use that money for. Um, so again, um, you know, if you are connected to an organization that is getting that stage one funding uh, from this $500 million arts, culture and support pot, uh, as I said, there's no limit to what you could use it for. Tara, anything more from your end? Um, I think just to keep note, when you're looking at all the different support material, uh, support systems that the government's putting out, to just note the eligibility period and how long things run till. Right now, we are in the emergency support phase, so maintaining jobs, keeping business operations. There are, of course, as we had outlined, a number of emergency measures that may apply for apply to you. Um, so please go ahead and access them and know that it's meant to get you through this emergency period where then we will go into more of the reopening phase of the economy um, and the arts, recognizing that performing arts festivals may be among um, the last to open where there's uh, large public gatherings. And then we'll get into more structural stimulus packages and long-term recovery. So that are those are the three phases that the government is approaching this with. There were some other questions. Okay, I haven't seen any other questions. So. Oh my God, I didn't know I was up. Okay, um, I know there Surprise. were. <laughs> there, there were some other questions for um, the two of you. Um, I don't know if Joe. You know what? We'll save those and uh, we'll save those for the end. But there were just a couple of there were just a couple of other questions. So um, we're gonna move forward with um, Adam, I believe. Is it Adam or I should be the one to know? Not, not that I should be the one to know, to know this. I didn't realize I'd be back up. Oh, it's Monty. You have to unmute yourself, Monty. <laughs> yes, there I am. So uh, talking about the budget, are we? Well, we, we did this year's budget on a projected membership of 600 people paying $50 each. Uh, the entire budget measures up to 43000 And um, one of our main expenditures that you might be wondering about is executive director, which would be, uh, as you know, or you may or may not know, um, the cast executive are unpaid. It's an unpaid position. So we were uh, looking for $12,000 to pay a part-time employee to do some of our administration. So that's a, a fairly large uh, line on the budget. And um, uh, advertise, communication, advertising, social media is uh, 5,000. And uh, basically our budget breaks down like that. The biggest line being $12,000 for uh, 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 executive director to do some of the administration that uh, we have a hard time uh, doing by ourselves. So that's how it breaks down. I'd, I'd, uh, I'd ask all of you to go and vote on it so that um, we can we can have it passed and move um, move it along down the line. The budget is fairly similar to what it was last year, and um, and that's about it. So please uh, please go and vote for it. Um. Joanne said for you to check out a comment on Facebook from Michael Lifshifts about the uh, budget. Yeah, just to reiterate, Monty said, you know, we are all volunteers and we've been working. Obviously, for Monty and I, we've been doing this from the beginning for three, three and a half years now. And, you know, it is a labor of love. It's a lot of work. 
Um, there is, you know, misconception sometimes in the community about what we're up to, but I can assure you that we uh, work sometimes around the clock. Uh, we are doing a lot of stuff that might not appear to be, uh, you know, whatever, a lot of work, but it is. And this is what running an organization like this means. This is what, you know, rallying for our community means. It means working and having conversations constantly with government and the industry. It's all the time. Uh, and so we just want more of the community to be involved so that we can continue to grow our organization uh, and, you know, create an infrastructure for uh, comedians in the country. Yeah, Sandra, and uh, as you know, I mean, it's certainly not a complaint that the executive is, is not paid, but it is because uh, that's what we signed up to do to volunteer. But um, sometimes people seem to misconstrue what we're doing and, and, and assume we're getting paid somehow yeah. when we are not. Yeah, exactly. So mm -hmm. this is why, you know, we do we do the cask as an organization needs money because we do we want to hold people on retainer like an executive director our social media person our pr person our lawyers these are critical people in an organization and without them you know we can't move forward so um yeah this is why well, yeah organize organizations uh, uh labor organizations cost some money to to have yeah. an infrastructure so you know that's what our budget is and uh um that's why i brought up the one uh part-time position that we're looking for to uh help us with the administration and uh now we'll turn it over to adam grow uh sorry if anybody has any questions about the budget please email monty at canadianstandup.ca and uh thank you monty that was awesome and uh thank now, you, adam, you're welcome and now adam take it away I am just so relieved someone else is taking care of the budget now. Thanks, Monty. <laughs> You're awesome. Uh, yeah, I'll have a close look at that, and I'll, I'll support the budget for CASC. Um, obviously, I've uh, focused my time now full-time on CANCOM, which is also a volunteer position. Uh, CANCOM is the foundation for Canadian comedy, and it was incorporated at the same time last year that CASC was incorporated. We did it at the same time. It's a separate incorporation. And to give you a very quick synopsis of what CANCOM is all about, it's not about advocacy and lobbying. It's about creating that economic and development infrastructure that doesn't exist for comedians. So while uh, it's more um, of an infrastructure and development and funding mechanism, certainly the conversations come up as Sandra alluded to earlier in this uh, very meeting because of COVID-19, uh, one of the things that the, the board of directors for CanCom was actively working on was just kind of parking business as usual and focusing on a very big study that I'm going to tell you about in a matter of minutes. Uh, but then all of a sudden there was an opportunity to communicate to uh, Canadian Heritage, uh, the Department of Canadian Heritage and the Minister of Heritage uh, directly. Uh, on behalf of comedians that, you know, look, there's a, an emergency situation happening right now. There is all this funding happen, uh, happening, which uh, Sean and Tara alluded to from uh, Global Public Affairs in terms of the arts sector. Uh, but we're worried that comedians are not going to be able to participate in that. And sure enough, in our call, uh, we got a lot of support for our work as professional artists across the country. But the message was, as you've heard a little bit already, uh, the 500 million that will be going as an emergency relief support for the cultural sector will be going through the proper channels or the existing channels. I shouldn't say proper, the existing channels. They're great. They're amazing channels, but they don't include comedians in all cases. So this is a problem that we faced over the last two or three years when we're in Ottawa talking about, uh, you know, the, the, the need to recognize that comedy is art and that comedians, uh, professional comedians across the country need to participate in the same kind of funding mechanisms. So the concern is, um, you know, perhaps a little bit in that second phase, there might be an opportunity, but CANCOM created a document to suggest to uh, the Minister of Heritage uh, and to the Department of Canadian Heritage that not only are comedians well positioned to help the cultural sector in general in Canada, be strongly positioned for a powerful recovery once this whole COVID-19 thing is over, COVID-19 thing is done, but we are also in the position to immediately start creating content. In fact, we already are. So how about you give a little bit of that money through CanCom to professional comedians across the country who can not only position 
the club sector, the um, comedy venue sector, whether it be uh, comedy clubs uh, that are uh, operating daily or uh, one-nighters uh, or um, sketch uh, and improv venues like Second City and Loose Moose and Vancouver Theater Sports. Why don't you give us some access to that funding so that we can create content in the virtual world because we're pretty good at it. We're pretty nimble. And the response was, unfortunately, don't get your expectations too uh, you know, uh, high. Uh, the first phase will be through the existing channels, which include the Department of Canadian Heritage, which, for instance, gives money to the Canadian uh, Arts Presentation Fund, which gives money to comedy festivals, uh, organizers of uh, comedy events, uh, and also the Canada Council for the Arts, which gives money to individual artists. Um, and while Global Public Affairs, Tara and Sean alluded to the fact that the council does accept, accept applications from comedians, we've expressed our concerns that that's problematic because we, when we set up that profile that Tara was talking about, we have to set up a profile as a theater artist or a literary artist, and then they have different criteria in terms of what your background and your experience should be. So anyway, um, the, pro the, the existing channels is not working for comedians, so we're hoping in the second phase that we will continue this dialogue and ultimately CanCom, the foundation for Canadian comedy, is about providing that, that opportunity to fill the void in the cultural sector so that individual comedy artists across the country can access grants and financial investment in order to be well positioned for a strong recovery in uh, in the COVID-19 times, uh, a strong cultural sector in regular times, and immediately create content now. So we'll continue that dialogue, but the, the big study that was happening before COVID-19, we applied to Ontario Creates, which is, um, uh, they have a program called the Business Intelligence Program, which is about creating um, data uh, for your particular sector to better understand the challenges and opportunities. So this application was submitted to Ontario Creates. And yes, there is an Ontario focus. And there is also uh, a unique focus on produced media, which is television, film, uh, digital, streaming content, books, magazines, anything that's produced. Um, and we, we've sent in an application particularly focused on uh, audiovisual and audio. So, you know, whether it be streaming content or film and television or albums and podcasts, not so much books and magazines. And the initial feedback from Ontario Creates, and uh, this is a, you know, a testament to them is what, uh, you, we're not gonna, we're not gonna accept your application because we don't really think you fit the mandate that we're looking for. Um, so the conversations that we had with Ontario Creates uh, they didn't immediately reject and say, no, thanks. It's not going to happen. They said, try to help us understand. Because when we look at what CanCom is all about, you don't only fund uh, professional activities of comedians when it comes to podcasts and albums and uh, and to, uh, and uh, produced media, streaming content, et cetera, et cetera. But you're, you got to focus on live. And we had an argument from CanCom to Ontario Creates that live is an integral part of the value chain in terms of uh, immediately creating content for produced media digitally, um, and then eventually being well positioned to have a television show or streaming content or an album or anything like that. So they're like, okay. So they, uh, in fact, did a 180 and decided to uh, give us the funding to do this study. So this funding from Ontario Creates even though it's focused on Ontario creators and even though it's focused on produced media, um, the argument has been made in, in the examination of the study to link live to produced media. And because a, a good majority of creators in the comedy uh, you know, sector do live in Ontario, we feel strongly that this will give a powerful representation of the entire country. Um, so don't worry uh, that it's funded by Ontario Creates and it's got to focus on Ontario creators. There is a real opportunity for us to learn from this because it's the first ever in Canada to look at comedy specifically. So it's not a study that looks at television in all genres or streaming media in all genres. This is the first ever spotlight on comedy creators across uh, you know, the entire province uh, and in uh, audiovisual and audio specifically. So what this is, is an opportunity for you to share your experiences 
to create an, uh, an opportunity for us to have actual data when we go to the government, when we go to Canada Council for the Arts, when we go to Canadian Heritage, when we go to MPs, they're always like, yeah, well, it sounds like you have an interesting story, but where's the, where's the stats? There's never been any data. And now we can put actual science behind the anecdotal stories that we all know and have been living and breathing for years, if not decades in this country. So next week, there's gonna be an online survey launched. The two main components of collecting this information are an online survey from individuals who have uh, either worked in Ontario and have left because they have had to pursue opportunities elsewhere, or primarily um, Ontario comedy creators who are currently living in Ontario. And when I talk about Ontario uh, comedy creators or people who have at some point in time in their career permanently called Ontario their residence, um, uh, we're talking about performers like stand-up, sketch, and improv artists. We're talking about independent production companies that produce content or develop an idea around a sketch, stand-up, or improv artist to pitch to a broadcaster or to a streaming service like Netflix or Prime or uh, Crave or Gem or uh, independent record labels who create content around comics to present to you know, Sirius XM or iTunes or Spotify. So those are the individuals or companies we're talking about when we talk about comedy content creators. So please look for that link to that uh, online survey and, um, and share it because we need hundreds of respondents to get enough data to provide the science to demonstrate that there is evidence to the anecdotal stories that we've been talking about. And so the last thing I'll say about that is that it's not only about the challenges that we face, uh, because CanCom is all about collaborating with all industry stakeholders. CanCom is, uh, is a foundation that's designed to create opportunities for independent comedy professionals in collaborations, uh, in collaboration with other industry stakeholders like venues, festivals, arts presenters, broadcasters, independent production companies, streaming services, everybody, uh, ultimately to create a, a big mechanism for a star structure in Canada that's never existed. And so it's important that uh, we kind of keep focus on not only is it about the challenges and the negativity, it's about what opportunities would make you more successful as a comedy content creator. And in particular, if you've left Ontario, why did you leave? Uh, what would keep you uh, calling Ontario your primary residence, uh, being able to travel uh, vertically in North America as a touring professional, being able to go to LA and New York to pitch shows, but still call Ontario home. So look for that. I'm excited about it. It's the first ever study of its kind. And, um, you know, uh, I can be uh, reached through social media for any questions that you might have on that. So thanks. I'm muted. Oh my God, the internet, right guys? Holy shit. Uh, thank you so much, Adam. That was great. Yes, please look out for that survey. It's vital uh, that we have a lot of participants. Um, yeah, because uh, building an economic impact uh, analysis for Canada will is crucial uh, as we move forward. Um, and so now I'm gonna introduce one of our newest members uh, on the executive board, Paul Sneps, who uh, we're pleased uh, has joined us. He is representing the sketch and improv uh, community, and uh, and yeah, I'll take it away, Paul. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be uh, be here and be participating with Cask. Um, I wanted to applaud the work so far that's been done by this group of people. It's really phenomenal um, and vital work. In particular, Sandra. Uh, a fantastic uh, keynote right off the top, State of the Union kind of uh, speech, just filled with heart and uh, and smarts and so much energy. So thank you so much to you, Sandra, and everyone who's participated so far. I think this is a really important uh, movement. The belief that that comedy is art has been at the heart of all of the work that my team and I at Toronto Sketch Fest have been doing for 15 years, advocating for um, for us comedians out there in clubs stuck in back corners of weird little bars, uh, doing work telling Canadian stories. Uh, I feel like, and I know that, that that is vitally important to everybody who's who's watching this today. Um, 
And uh, my team and I together have been historically very successful in attracting uh, government funding, public funding from all three levels of government. And so it's that experience that I want to bring to bear for CASC uh, as part of the board. So uh, I'm also thrilled that CASC has evolved so quickly and so positively uh, and is open to the idea of expanding the scope of the work that we are doing to include the likes of sketch comedians and improv comedians, really all practitioners of the comedic arts in Canada. Um, and so to that end, I'd like to encourage all sketch, com uh, sketch comedians, improv folks, people out there doing musical comedy, get involved. Um, jump in here, become a member of CASC and um, yeah, put your stake in the ground and s tell the world that what, you, what you're doing has meaning because that's what we're here to do. Um, I, I, I also understand that there's, some, uh, there's something to a name. <laughs> this, this is a truism. Uh, the Canadian Association of Stand-Up Comedians has the word stand-up in it. Don't be allergic. Um, this is a reflection of the original people who got up, got angry enough, got upset enough to start getting organized. Uh, and so us as, as folks coming late to the party, I think we need to uh, applaud the people who came before. But understand this too, that um, this is a, a very well-intentioned group of people who have you in their sights as well. Uh, we're here, uh, I'm here, and we've got your back also. And so somewhere down the line, uh, there's a willingness to look at changing the name to be more inclusive of all the comedic arts in Canada. Um, right now with COVID-19, it's not the time. So we will table this for now and we'll come back to it. Uh, really, I, I just wanted to say in, in closing that I joined the board really just to add my voice and my experience uh, to this movement. I think it's super important. Um, and where I'd like to apply my energy on this board is in the areas of arts advocacy and government liaison. So I'm very much new, pretty much brand new to this board. And I'm excited to work with Sandra and everybody on the board and roll up sleeves and get started. So thanks for having me and feel free to get in touch with me anytime with your concerns, sketch comedians, improv, stand up folks. We're all in this, this fight together as well as the bigger ones. So um that's it for me uh we'll pass it on now to daryl purvis it's yeah it's actually it's actually going to daryl wow upside down i love it there we go there guys daryl purvis thank you oh i just want to say thank you thank you so much paul um the yeah it is it, it's a real um moment to have uh you know someone from the sketch and improv world there is actually an, another board uh seat open and um and we are hoping to fill that soon so anyone uh, out there who would like to join the board please contact us at info at canadianstandup.ca um we are looking for more sketch and improv uh, representation um so yeah take it away dara thank you Sandra. uh I guess I just want to start by thanking Adam Groh, who was up here a little while ago, who um, I is no longer a CASC board member, still a CanCom, but no longer a CASC. Uh, he's done so much work for comedians. I don't think you guys realize how much work that guy's put in. <clears throat> just to let you know about me, uh, I'm new as well. There's a lot of new people on the board. Um, I'm here because uh, late February, Barry Taylor, who was also on the board, came to me and asked, um, if I would take his place, basically. It was late February. I think he knew COVID was coming. So basically what I'm saying is Barry Taylor's working with the Chinese. Um, but basically my history, I'm 22 years into comedy. I'm a frustrated comic like everybody else, wondering why we still have to work so hard to get anywhere in this country. Why does Britain have a star system? Why? Why? That we don't. So I think uh, <laughs> because Barry is a good friend and on the board, I was basically constantly messaging him with my concerns about comedy. So um, one night he asked me to take his place. And again, thank you to Barry for all the work he's done on the board. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm new, like most of the other people here. I don't really know what I'm doing yet. Just trying to help. I say stupid things at meet meetings. Seems to help, I think. And... Uh, 
yeah, I just, if you have any concerns, come to me and talk to me. I, I'll, I'm here to help. That's all I want to do. And yeah, just, you know, I'm tired of the fact that the goal as a stand-up comedian in this country is to marry a rich person. That that can't be how we make our money. We we need we need to fix this. There's a lot of problems. And yeah, I'm just here to help. And I think that's really all I have to say for now. So I'll bring Sandra up or am I introducing Drew? I think I'm introducing Drew. So here's another uh, new board member. Okay. Uh, he's our funding officer. This is Drew Pick, like everybody. Hi, how's it going? Thank you for the intro, uh, Daryl. Yeah, I uh, I'm just joined the board as well in the past couple of weeks and was brought on uh, at the, uh, the request of Sandra. She knows that I have some past experience with uh, labor organizations, both in the States and here in Canada. Uh, so she thought my skills could maybe be applied to CASC and I agreed. So I've, I've come on to, uh, help out with, uh, funding specifically because, uh, just looking at some of your comments as well, uh, that have been submitted, a lot of people want to know how CASC is going to, uh, fund itself with a certain budget. So, uh, I've kind of taken on the role of figuring out ways to kind of innovate on what we've already been doing to both expand uh, membership of CASC to increase funding that way and also to maybe start applying uh, some resources outside of CASC itself to uh, other not-for-profits and um, donors uh, as well as some other potential uh, hi Anna Maria uh, some other potential uh, funding schemes that we'd like to roll out uh, throughout the year so yeah I've, I've joined on to help uh, do that so we can be funded and effective in achieving everything that we set out to do. Um, I'm going to be working closely with Charlie Demers, uh, who's in Vancouver, uh, and who I will now throw to for you guys to hear from. So nice to meet you, and thank you. Charlie, the floor is yours. Okay. Hello. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, thank you very much. And I just want to say that uh, just because I'm up last doesn't make me the headliner. But I will say that uh, I was the only person at the last cast meeting to appear virtually. And this time, <laughs> everybody's doing it. Uh, so a bit of a trendsetter. Uh, I guess you'd call me kind of a trailblazer uh, in Canadian comedy, maybe. Um, uh, yeah, I uh, joined the board uh, last summer, um, although uh, this uh, fall I was uh, dealing uh, with a, a bit of a medical issue uh, that I, I didn't realize I was dealing with, uh, but uh, dealing with a medical issue that was uh, diagnosed at the beginning of this year. Uh, everything is uh, currently being uh, taken care of. Everything is okay. And in fact, um, the treatment is uh, covered by um, uh, my insurance through the actors union and has all been a real, um, reminder of just how important, uh, getting covered, uh, getting the kind of coverage and insurance and, 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 uh, group coverage, uh, and, uh, uh, protections, uh, as artists, uh, for comedians, uh, that, that we need just how important, uh, just how important that is. And any of us who have coverage through, uh, membership in the WGC or, uh, coverage, uh, through membership in ACTRA, uh, know just, just how vital, um, that is to, to our well Uh, but it meant that, uh, this past fall was not as, uh, active for me as I would have liked to, uh, have been in, uh, my role as the membership officer. And so, uh, was hoping to uh, really hit the ground uh, running. And then um, uh, I don't know if you guys have got this COVID thing in, uh, in Ontario, but it's been pretty big out here. Hold for applause. Uh, so, um, yeah, my uh, last presentation uh, at uh, CASC, uh, if you uh, remember, uh, was primarily about the importance of uh, lowering the discrepancy between our on-paper uh, membership and our paid-up dues-paying membership, uh, which uh, right now uh, is separated by about a factor of uh, four or five. Uh, there are about four or five times as many 
members in terms of uh, people who are listed as being members of CASC um, uh, or on the membership rolls versus actual paid up dues paying members of CASC. Uh, we're at about uh, 900 or just shy of a thousand uh, people who uh, are members uh, and just shy of 200 uh, uh, members who, who are actually paying um, annual dues. Uh, any of you who are members of other arts unions um, in the country will know that uh, at the moment, more or less everyone has uh, suspended dues collection in the face of uh, the uh, COVID uh, work stoppage, uh, which is unprecedented. I mean, across uh, all industries. Um, the major difference between ACTRA and CASC uh, or the Writers Guild and CASC is that they were getting dues before all this happened. Uh, so uh, one of the things that this has really shown, this crisis, is the enormous discrepancy between how much our community needs CASC uh, and how much our community was, uh, to put it frankly, um, paid up and, 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 and putting, putting our money where our mouth was. And, and I'm using the past tense here so that we can all safely uh, distance ourselves from that uh, past behavior. Um, but we're not at the moment asking everybody, obviously, to, to step up uh, and, and start paying dues right now because we know that nobody's working, uh, including us. Um, uh, but uh, once this uh, has uh, passed and this too shall pass uh, and uh, we have uh, deferred all uh, dues collection until uh, later on in the year. I think it's now been deferred to um, September or October. Uh, we really do need uh, for uh, every comedian in the country uh, who is a, a, a member and, and considers the work that CASC uh, is doing to be vital uh, to, to pay their dues, uh, be, not only because of what that allows us to do as an organization, but because of what that uh, means for when we go and meet with ministers, meet with insurance organizations, meet with other unions that we uh, want to partner with in terms of coverage. They don't look at the number of people that we have on a list who say they want to be members of CASC they look at the number of paid uh, members that we have. Um, so uh, that will be a big part of the focus once things get that, uh, back underway. I'm just going to check that all of these uh, comments aren't saying, um, uh, OK, so people can hear me, right? OK. Um, uh, the, um, uh, the other thing, as uh, Drew mentioned, is we're going to be looking at uh, different possibilities of funding streams uh, that aren't coming uniquely from dues. So one thing that I would uh, really like for us to be looking at once shows get started up again is looking at um, uh, shows being um, cask uh, cask approved, uh, you know, cask supporting shows uh, that that one nighters, um, you know, uh, all the way up to clubs uh, that are using cask talent um, set aside a certain amount of their door to to go to cask. Obviously, not an amount that would hobble any room that's getting started, but just a, a token amount to uh, contribute to the well-being of, of comedians across the country. Because we are an organization that is for everyone from the people who are just starting out uh, doing open mics uh, uh, to, to headliners. Um, uh, the other big foci, uh, which is the plural of uh, focus, uh, is uh, going forward. Uh, as Paul said, we want to grow our organization um, to represent uh, uh, more improv comics, represent more sketch comedians. The only people not welcome in CASC are spoken word poets. I think I speak for the board when I say that. Uh, otherwise, we want everyone on board. Um, so uh, we're looking at expanding membership that way, but we're also looking at expanding membership geographically across the country. Obviously, right now, CASC is, is primarily focused in uh, the Toronto area, and uh, we want to, uh, you know, so is Canada. Uh, but uh, I'm in Vancouver, obviously. 
uh, and uh, we uh, are looking to grow the organization um, uh, from coast to coast to coast. We have terrific ambassadors all across the country. Uh, uh, Drew and I are interested in building out uh, a, a sort of locals model uh, that will provide for a bit more sort of on the ground organization uh, across the country uh, that will uh, make people feel more connected uh, to the organization uh, in their in their immediate um, environments. Uh, so we want to build out the organization uh, on the ground. We want to build out the organization uh, in terms of our financial capability and in terms of our organizational capability, our ability to stand up for comedians' rights uh, when it comes to the clubs, when it comes to... Uh, the uh, s s streaming and uh, funding uh, when it comes to festivals, when it comes to uh, everything that has to do with comedy in this country. Uh, all of that begins and ends with membership. Uh, it begins and ends with who is part of CASC, who takes uh, membership in CASC seriously, and considers it part and parcel of being a comedian in this country. Uh, so uh, right now, I think the emergency relief fund shows just how important uh, this association is for our community in terms of being there in these very difficult, uh, terrifying times. Uh, and uh, when things are better again, and they will be better again, uh, we uh, need to uh, make sure that we don't forget uh, how important uh, this organization was uh, during the scary days and uh, make sure that the next time our community is confronted with a challenge, whether it's uh, something like the JFL streaming takeover of satellite radio or something like uh, COVID-19, whatever it is, we have the resources in place to face that uh, the best we can. And that means an active, paid up, engaged membership uh, that sees this organization as their own. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Um, I want to bring back the, some of the exact, I don't know how many of us can fit on the screen, but we're just going to use these last uh, little bit to uh, answer any questions. I know there were quite a few, but uh, Joe is going to post, um, Joe or Joanne Britton is going to post those questions. You know what I love? Like, I know you don't see this on Facebook, but Drew and Charlie are upside down. It's hilarious for me. <laughs> yeah. Am I? <laughs> Not where I'm sitting. That's so funny. You both are upside down. Um, you were upside down for a long time, Sandra, too, to me. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Oh, isn't that, that's crazy. I mean, well, who knows? I didn't, I didn't want to say anything. I thought it would be rude. <laughs> <laughs> we're still live, but I don't know. Joe, Joe, are you sending questions in? Anyways, I mean, oh, I see no – oh, she sees no questions. Okay, well – does any any of the board have any questions for the for the for the membership, <laughs> or any questions for us each other? <laughs> I think they were all answered. Joe did answer the questions. Um, you know what? I guess I'm just gonna take this opportunity. I thank you all from the top, but I want to thank the exec again, um, and uh, and you know, and the community for supporting us, and and you know, it is really crucial that you get involved. We do need a lot of help. Um, you know, the way that CASC has worked is that if you have an initiative or a committee that you want to, that you want to start, you just need to ask us, um, and we will support you through it. Um, and that's the way that the work gets done. And, and we've done so much. I mean, most, a lot of people will comment on the fact that we've managed to accomplish so much in such little time. So that's a real testament to all the people that are here the people that have come before us and uh, the people that will continue to come. We have, uh, Joe, uh, there is one question from Anna. Um, so Anna Gustafson, is there a campaign plan to promote cask supported shows when we get there and criteria for what that means to those producing shows? Um, we have, we do have a criteria, Anna, for shows um, that shows that have, uh, that have, um, uh, 
we're, we're benefiting, not benefiting, but uh, in support of CASC. There is criteria for that, uh, but moving, like once we get to out of, out of this crisis, we'll probably have to revisit that. If that's something that you wanna help work on, I mean, that'd be great. Um, but I can send that, uh, what we have so far to you, if you'd like. I'll just send it to you. Sandra, I'm, I've seen a couple of questions about uh, the voting links not working. I just wanted to state vocally that you need to sign in first in order yeah. to actually be able to vote. So everybody out there who's watching, who's interested in doing so, just log yourself in if you're an existing cast member and then uh, you'll, you'll be set. Yeah, voting, oh, here. Oh, can we send an email out to unpaid members asking them to pay up? Some people maybe lapsed their paid membership and forgot to pay their annual due. Also, thanks so much for the hard work. Thank you so much, Tim. Uh, yes, well, we we have uh, we have sent messages out to uh, unpaid members, but again, that campaign to get more paid members will begin once we see that um, you know, a, like Charlie and Drew are going to work on on you know those steps um, as we approach September, and right, right, guys. Yep. Yeah. There was a Charlie's, Charlie's frozen right now, but I think I'll speak for both yeah, of us Charlie. by saying, yeah. "Yep." Uh, I think Kathy Boyd had a question. There was a question, Joe, that we we saw that disappeared. No more questions. Okay, I thought there was one from Kathy Boyd. Um, yeah. So again, to everyone who's watching, please uh, email uh, info at Canadian Stand Up for any uh, and all questions. Uh, just to recap, the emergency relief fund for Canadian comedians is still going strong. Uh, please apply if you're in need. Uh, please donate if you can. Um, as we said, we are waiting money from GoFundMe. It's been a real slog. It's been like weeks where we're supposed to receive the money and we haven't. So uh, we're working really diligently to get that money so that we can do those lotteries. Um, and yeah, uh, and just always watch updates from us. So uh, I think that's all for now. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Bye. Thank you. And, and stay strong and healthy. Can't wait to see you for real. Bye.